So without further ado, you remember this wonderful gentleman, Ia Wojtek-Osoller, who is going to talk about one more incredible <coughs> innovation which Portuk actually brought from the world of adults into the world of childhood and made it work and made it work wonderfully. So bets. Who would think that children should actually use bets? Good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here. Can see you. Uh, yes, bats, uh, bats, and best. You can see it here. Yeah? Bats, best. Uh, uh, it's one of my favorite methods of uh, of Korczak. Uh, I, I I really love it. It's beautiful and simple, and maybe it's beautiful because it's simple. But it's, it's, it was, I, uh, maybe it is, but it's rather Ira's experience. Uh, but it was extremely uh, powerful. Uh, as you probably remember, Karczak and, its, and his collaborators developed many methods uh, to, to, to manage many areas of, of the social life in the uh, orphan's home. We know something about court of peers, we, we will know something about plebiscite, and now I'd like to tell you something about bats. Uh, I love this photo. It's really uh, amazing. Korczak is a conductor, uh, and it reflects also many features of Korczak's system. Because uh, from the one, on the one hand, uh, he's a conductor, so he has to see forest and tree. Yeah? He has to see orchestra and individual musician. But uh, from the other side, also mus musicians, yes, have to uh, take care of themselves. They, they have to be responsible for their individual music, but they are also responsible for the whole orchestra. And that's the, I think, very useful metaphor of, of the or orphan's home and generally about uh, Korczak's institutions. Uh, that's why I wrote uh, in the text which uh, will be published in Tatiana's book that bats and other methods reflect a crucial feature of Korczak's approach to create institutional conditions that encourage residents to practice a balance between the enactment of self-skills like self-confidence, self-control or, or self-awareness and co-skills, like cooperation, co-responsibility, or co-existence. And I, I think that uh, this, um, this idea is really, really important for, for, for understanding Korczak, but also it's very modern. It's very, very important for us because because of many, many reasons, cultural, social, and many, many others, uh, in, in, in so many societies we can, we can see uh, rather, you know, going to, to, to self or co, which is better, I don't know. Probably the best is the, the balance, yes? Uh, the co-skills area uh, was managed, among others, by the Court of Peers, and the self-skills area was managed, among others, by bats. So let's imagine the situation. That's the orphan's home. That's the main hall with uh, more or less 15 tables for more than 100 children, precisely 
um, that photo is from 1940. It was made by a German photograph, Nazi photograph. So here we can see uh, more or less 150 children. So more because it was the beginning of the Second World War. However, uh, that's the main hall. And on the right, here, you, 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 we can see it. But if you will stay here, here, and turn right, you'll see also today a small room. It was shop, just shop, internal shop of, of the orphan's home. But once a week, they had a bats in that place, uh, behind the closed doors, only for two people, one kid and one adult. And they were the actors of, in this, in this uh, method. And they had their own roles. Role of the kid, choosing a challenge which should be desired, dependent on him or her, countable, real. I mean, you know, it's uh, just similar to, to smart uh, methods, yes, or smart technique. It could be, for example, to start or to finish doing something, something wrong, something, something good, doesn't matter. However, this method was designed rather, uh, rather for children who, who needed support to cope with bad habits, cursing, lying, spitting, fighting, something like this. But I'm convinced that it's that it was and it can be uh, used also to improve skills, to improve and, and to achieve very ambitious uh, goals. Uh, the second part of the role of kids, being ready to meet the challenge and start the conversation with adult. Um, and the role of educator, only, only that, asking writing down and making an agreement. That's all. Without judging, without thinking, for example, what children should do or who children should be and why. And what is convenient, what is not convenient uh, about culture, about anything, about, you know, education, about pedagogy and, and, and many, many things. Just asking, writing down and making an agreement. Uh, and please uh, track with me. This is the reconstruction of possible dialogue. I really laughed at moment. <laughs> That's the adult. Hello, what do you want to bet on? Hello, I'd like to stop cursing. Could you imagine that situation in our school, maybe in your school, I don't know. Uh, in, in school in, in Poland, definitely not. You, are you cursing? Are you crazy? It's, no, it's, it, it can be. Let's go and, and, and go back with your parents, it's something like this. But here, yes, you know, asking, writing down and so on. So, the first question, or rather the second question, is how many times a week do you curse? <laughs> That's why I love it, yeah. Uh, how many times? So it's uh, something like diagnosis, yes? Uh, and the answer is about 40, for example. And yes, could you? <laughs> yes, but uh, it's so powerful question because it, it, it pushes child to think about him or herself, to count it, to think, to remind, yes, to think, hmm, it was, I don't know, Józek, Miecio, Krysia, or Christina, or Joseph, or anyone, yes, uh, twice, uh, maybe, you know, it's a big process. 
a big internal process in, in, uh, in the child. However, could you also imagine the reaction now? 40? 40, it's unacceptable. It can, no, it's impossible. But it's not the role, yeah? 40. Uh, and I'm really, yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the next question. How do you think? Why? Why? No? How many times would you like to? Exactly. How many times do you want to curse next week? Because we have... We have a... <laughs> we have a diagnosis. And we need a goal. Yes? Uh, and especially when, when uh, it was the first experience of, of, of Kit, I mean the first time when he or she uh, tried to, 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 to use this method, the answer very often was, how do you think? Yeah. Yes, of course, that's why I'm here, yes? I have to, I, I, I need to be innocent, yes? But, uh, Okay, if you if you want to, we can we can do it, but uh, experienced educator knew that it's mm, really hard. So now it's also a question, but th at the same time it's the proposal. What kind of proposal? How do you think? What's yes, uh huh, and for example. Will you be able to go from 40 to none? If so, let's go, let's do it. No, I don't know, yes, I have to think about it. So, if not, maybe go to 30 for a start. You can curse, <laughs> can you imagine? You can curse 30 times next week. <laughs> yes, it's really, it's really funny, but it's also challenging. Uh, you have um, in your uh, uh, books, uh, in your translations, How to Love a Child, uh, in the volume uh, two, there, is some, there are some chapters from humorous pedagogy. And there is a chapter about fighting. And there is a description about um, uh, the very similar method, uh, the bet with with myself, yes? How many fights do I need? For example, five. Or maybe ten, but a little one. Yes? I can see big fight and small fight and maybe medium fight, I don't know. But I can count it and I can manage it. So that was not only... Um, yes, he, he also wrote about it. Okay, so if, okay, the last step was the bed is on meet me here in a week and tell me about your progress if you succeed you'll get two pieces of candy if you don't you will give me two pieces of candy is that okay two or three it's not clear uh, you'll have uh, handouts with description of that method and here we we, we know that uh, it's three pieces of candy, but it doesn't matter really. Um, it's not acceptable now, yes, I mean Why candy. Hmm? How about those candies? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, I'm convinced, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, can you see the... <laughs> yes, it will be. It will be enough. Yes, for for all of them. That's, that's good. Uh, I'm thinking about. Uh, okay, I uh, I had a series of lectures at the University of Warsaw, uh, the Faculty of Psychology, because I'm already convinced. However, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, that many Karchak's methods and approach are really similar to many approaches and even. Uh, you know, uh, experiments in, in psychology or in social psychology, which made later 
yes, than Korczak. For example, here is a pure example of, uh, of an issue of internal and external motivation. Yes, internal, internal motivation can't be so big, so, so high, yes, because it's, uh, it won't work. So that's the, that's the point. He, of course, he, he just knew it because of his uh, practice. But he knew it and he used it. Uh, next steps, or rather, next conversations. Week, first week, 30 and it's done. Second week, uh, 35, yes. Uh, less and less, step by step, week by week. But maybe the third, and maybe 20, yes. But it's failed. Yes, it's natural. But maybe the next one, 20, yes. Now succeed. And week by week, to none. To none, but uh, this zero, this none, it's also the matter of bad uh, some weeks, yes, maybe five, maybe four, uh, because he or she really needed to be sure that it's definitely uh, done. And after I don't know how many weeks, yes, it's very uh, individual, but after some weeks uh, he or she, they, they were you know, really winners. Yes, it's, it was extremely powerful for them. It was um, like children's agency in practice. It was, I think that uh, uh, it was a real victory not only for, for them, I mean for children, but also for all of educators. And now, I'd like to give you an opportunity to fill it. I've prepared a little exercise for you. Um, what do you think about it? Do you want to try? Uh, I'd like to encourage you because that's exactly that's the exercise which Ira mentioned uh, yesterday. So uh, we need pairs. So please split into pairs, and I will tell you what's what next. Okay. You, 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 yes, you should sit close to each other. Would you like to do it also? No? Okay. Well, we will be like white Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. They will start, they will start cursing and we will come. <laughs> <laughs> that's the stage, yes, okay. Uh, I'll give you um, procedure, step by step. You need a decision who will be a kid and who will be an educator or adult, yes? And uh, depends on this, you, uh, you'll see what next, what is the next step. If, it, if someone, something will be unclear, please ask me, okay? Improved version. It's so maybe, maybe. She needs help. She's always telling me what I need to change. She's telling me what I need to change. I'm still going to say what I want to change. And just let's do it. We, we, we have time.
I was even higher. <laughs> I tried, yeah, I was looking at that. I knew what I do. <laughs>
question is how do you feel and what do you think about it? experience It was called in Polish Bursa. I have no idea how it's in English. That. It, it teaches seminary, yeah, in the old days. It's like a teacher's college. You're like apprentices. Uh, uh, it was, it was uh, something like that, uh, I don't know, 20 years uh, boy uh, wanted to you know, study or, or work in Warsaw, but uh, he, and he, and he had uh, a, a bad uh, food. <laughs> But he needed to, you know, teach them or, yeah. or anything, yes? Yeah. Uh, that, that was the, the, the idea. And Korczak was convinced that the bats, uh, that method is really great for them, but they didn't want to use it. <laughs> yes, they, maybe, maybe not completely. It's not the, the, the situation that they, you know, refused, yes? And, but. Um, it was something uh, difficult for them. And Korczak even wrote about himself that he 
uh, try to do with himself to, to cope with some things, and and we know that um, that he succeed uh, except smoking. Yes, it it wasn't so powerful tool to to, to stop smoking. So I think that uh, the mechanism then and now is real similar. Uh, I mean that for uh, more than I don't know. 14 or I, I don't know exactly it's changing yeah uh, but but there is something with uh, mindset yes and 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 uh, this method is uh, is difficult also probably for for our teenagers uh, difficult yeah I think with teens it's more there's more accountability peer to peer than there is adult to teen yes. so if there was if there was more of a mechanism like the student teachers to bet with each other mm -hmm. rather than with the an adult, it may have more of an impact. Just my experience is many people become very peer focused in adolescence, um, so it's less important to have the acceptance or the ticky box from the adult. But we know also, uh, maybe it's you know, the, 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 the second phase of Janusz uh, but we know also that he had some problems with teens because he and he expressed it that you we, we, we know exactly the, the, the sentence you he, he meant teens you are an unnatural you are not so I, I don't know how to express it in English so naive or so so um, not cynical as children so I it's not the same level of, of you know, uh, I, I, I can trust you so much as, as, as children, uh, and some things had problems with it. For example, uh, people who are, you know, during these this meetings, Thursday, Thursday meetings uh, in, in editor's office of Little Review. We know the case when uh, a young uh, girl, uh, she was so shy and she was so confused because she knew that for Korczak teens are not so acceptable like children. So yeah, so we, we know about it. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I, do, I, do, I did that with my students. Uh, one of them was arriving late in the day and I told him, I said, okay, it's great to have a, a deal. I'm going to have to call you every morning. And I did call him. It took a long time for him to be on time. But every morning before I left, I called him to make sure that he would be here on his way to school. How much time did you give him to wake up, have breakfast, and go? I would call him as soon as I, as I got up, so it would be about 6, 6.30. 6.30? Yeah, 6, 6, between 6 and 6.30. And the class started? At 8.30. So you gave him two or two and a half hours, yeah. and he didn't succeed? No, it took him a long time, but when he did, when he was on time, he would come into my office and he would say, I'm here, mm, and okay. he was proud, <laughs> and he was, he was like a great, a great man. I'm here, what do you want, yes, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> and I did that this year also with another student. Those are challenged students, they have a, a so, and one of them I told, I, I would tell her, I said, okay, I'm going to call you tomorrow morning, don't forget, that's a chance. She would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they answer the phone? Yeah, 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 they give me their cell phone and they answer. They will always answer their phones. <laughs> <laughs> well, at 6 in the morning, who knows, you know. Uh, Judith, you wanted to say something? No, yeah. I just was wanted to be more clear about the previous subject. I'm not sure I understood what you were trying yeah. to say about the not proper, or not these methods. Wait, maybe if you can pass yes. the microphone, because yeah. we don't know. I just didn't understand the uh, comment that you made earlier uh, about... About things? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that... Uh, the relation or thinking of Karczak about children and, and youth 
we don't know exactly the, the age, but it, it wasn't the same. So children were for him more trustful, more natural, more, how to put it? Uh, Innocent. Excuse me? Innocent. Innocent, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and teens not. And teens were... Um, yes, yes, they were more complicated and they uh, not so simple, you know, in contact. In, in, uh, so that was the problem for, for him. However, of course, he, you know, he, he worked with, with teens and he uh, accepted them. But uh, with a distance, yeah, I think that the, maybe that's the, the most appropriate word. Yeah. Uh, I just remember my grade seven and my grade eight were very teacher I've ever had and uh, her method was for example okay here is the start and here is the uh, the solution what what was the path uh -huh. yes what is between please explain it it was you know yeah she, she was genius mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get a better understanding the context of adolescence in those days we were expected at a certain age to go to work, it was no longer, um, you're no longer a child, you're now sort of like a mini adult. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered, like, is there more context to when that was expected? Like, he only took orphans up until 14. So was it, then they would go off to work, they would pick a profession, they would return to their family? I think that uh, more important was, how to put it, legal context or something like this, yes? The, the most appropriate age to go to work just to find a job. That's why 14, many orphanages had their own rules about it, yes? Uh, some of them, uh, for example, I don't know, in the United States, I know historical examples, uh, that they accepted uh, children from 10 or 12, yes? No less. Why? I don't know. But uh, it's, it's not about his ideas or his approach, but rather uh, it's about... Because the, the, the beginning of this rule is at the end of, uh, of whole history, just uh, before the orphan's home, I mean um, in 1907. Because the orphan's home uh, belonged to the society, a Jewish society, uh, help, for, help for orphans. That was the name of that society. Uh, and it was established in 1907. So just before Korczak, because Korczak joined them in 1909. And, and this you know, rule between 7 and 14 province from that time. So, yeah. Can I add to this? No. Uh, in Russia, because Poland was part of Russia at the time, 14 was like the age when you can start working, and you're absolutely right. That was the age when children would become adults, like, like formally. When the Soviet Russia started the education system, at some point, I think in late 1920s, they made it mandatory, the education for children, seven grades, until the age of 14. 
So that was like like the point when children formally would become adults. Although today, by United Nations definition, it's 18. A child is a person until the age of 18. Although, when we talk with our own children, and they're like 14, 15, we say, come on, you're an adult, now stop it. You're big enough to understand, right? But formally, he or she's still a child until 18. So, yeah, 14 is like, uh, it's not Korchik's invention. That was the rule at the time. Let's continue. Uh, that's uh, my proposal of, um, how to put it, it's instead of Swiss, yes? However, I think Swiss a very good idea now, <laughs> <for you. laughs> because you know, uh, it's, uh, I think... And pay attention, he, he's using my hand. <laughs> <laughs> the bag is his, the hand is a mine. Called theory into action. Yes, yes, into sweet action, I think. Okay, so that's why. Like, he said he knows swearing. the source of diabetes. And, yes. and I keep swearing. You have to try Korchak. Uh, you try Swiss. No, no? Okay. Uh, can you put out name tags clearly? Oh, you have. Okay, uh, so that's my proposal, but uh, you can use whatever you, you think is uh, uh, it's good for your situation. The next, uh, I'm just finishing, but I'd like to tell you about two, two things. One is striking, striking similarity between pets and coaching. And uh, I can, I think, I can just prove it because it's a quotation from uh, Coaching Skills, a handbook by Jenny Rogers. She's a guru of coaching in UK. And, and please note, uh, the six principles, the client is resourceful. Yeah, that was like in, in, in bets. The coach's role is to develop the client's resourcefulness. Exactly. Uh, coaching addresses the whole person. The whole person in that context means not only you as a child, but you as a human being. A child, because if you're only a child, it means that you should be someone or should do something. Because that's the children's role in our society. And in this method, you're not only, also, but not only a child, you're a human being, the whole person. The client sets the agenda, exactly. Uh, the coach and the client are equals, and that's true, because, as you probably remember, that was the basic, among others, of the court of peers. Court of peers, uh, we know story. And it's described by Korczak in How to Love a Child in the Orphan's Home about the beginning of the Court of Peers. Because children, at the beginning, they refused to use this method. It was uh, unaccessible, uh, uh, unacceptable for them. And Korczak, uh, and Korczak, it was also amazing. And Korczak tried to not to stop it but to understand why. And he made a break, and he uh, retaught about it, and, and he established, among others, that also adults can be sued by children. So, and that's uh, the story from, from the book. So here, the coach and the client are equals, like in Korczak's uh, bets. And coaching is about change and action, and that's true. However, in the orphan's home, uh, the coaching or betting was something about more deeper, not only about change and action, but about emotions, about self-awareness, about self-confidentiality, and many other, other things. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's, 
the idea, the similarity, is really waiting for, you know, for deeper understanding and for, for uh, describing. So maybe, maybe you want to do it one day. And the last sentence from the beautiful uh, text of a very interesting man, Zalman Wasserzuk. Zalman Wasserzuk. The bats reflects vitality and the will of the fight of a small child wrestling with, with oneself. In the bats, the main goal is self-improvement, which is a principal foundation of the human soul. Zalman Wasserzug was an educator in, in Bursa, I've mentioned about it, in this teacher's seminar, yeah? Uh, and he wrote a, a series of, of uh, texts in Yiddish uh, and he published it in 1927 and I know that Jerry is trying to uh, is trying to maybe not by himself but he's trying to uh, translate it into English uh, and it's a priceless source because we know about uh, Orphan's Home from the Korczak's book. It was written in 19, it was published in 1920. And seven years later, we, uh, we, had, we have the, the, the source like this. However, uh, yeah, and uh, I think that's really powerful method, really modern method. And even if you haven't an opportunity to use it, to have something like this in your mind is, uh, I, I'm really convinced, is, is really uh, important. And that's all. Thank you very much. So, we're going on with the one of the most incredible ideas which Ira started talking about yesterday, and that is the postcards. And if you think about a postcard, how many postcards did you receive in your life? Just think about 100,000 to like million, thousands, yeah? How many times? Not like really. a handful. A handful. Secret? Where? Not many, or all no. many. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alice. I got a lot from my children. Okay. Judith. Before uh, the internet or after? That's, uh, that's what I was hoping to hear. And what did she say? She said before internet or after that. Uh -huh. So, right? So, the generation which most of this part of the group belongs to, that was very, very common, right? To write and mail. And it was beautiful to open the mailbox and receive postcards or, or letters. Now, it's kind of a handful. So, in the times, it was the only way to communicate by mail, and it made an impact on people when they received something, and they kept it as a treasure. So Korczak managed to put this treasure into his education system, and it worked. All yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that's a great, great introduction to focus on actually the, the the, the context and what we have with postcards. When I, when I was younger and, and traveled a bit, uh, the standard thing was to get postcards. They fit uh, from wherever you want. Wherever you would go, you'd get a collection of postcards. For young people, it's not the same um, because it's so easy to just take the picture, but we would do that. We would, we would uh, get the postcards, we'd collect them, and that would be our souvenirs. And we, when I was a little kid, and we'd get them, my, my, my mom and my dad would, uh, we'd get, we'd actually make an album of postcards. So I have those of Florida, of St. Augustine, all the things, the trips that we made. Uh, and, and it was just something that it was, it was from an older time. 
And I think Korchak, his, his collecting postcards as a traveler, you have these things. And, you know, it, and I learned, as he, Wojciech talked about being resourceful. He, he used what was, what was at his disposal to, to, uh, to involve and to engage. It, they, it was all, again, part of the toolkit. So in, in any event, the title is mine. It's not connected to anything specifically towards uh, Korchak. So when I say uh, partner, defender, and community, that's going to be part of what I'm going to present for you today, how uh, this has uh, evolved. And what I will try and do is, is introduce a sense of the postcards and give you a very, very focused activity uh, and a series uh, that has developed over the years that you can incorporate. Uh, raise your hand again. I, I know there was an English teacher yesterday who's not here, but are there any teachers? Okay, great, great. What I can give you, this is something that is tried and true over the years, a, a, an absolute uh, great way of incorporating this methodology into practice. And again, from Wojciech, who every time I go to a presentation, I, I, I learn something. As he talked about the bets and the wagers as beautiful, simple, and powerful, Postcards are beautiful, simple, and powerful. So keep your ears open. You learn from everybody. You never, and it, it, and it, it is a way of improving skills. And uh, I have found it's a way of building relationships and extending the relationships in the community. So as of as, uh, yesterday, I, I this is just something about postcards. This is generally the young person's uh, uh, reaction to postcards. Yeah, you know, it's something like, it, and I saw something uh, again on my wife's uh, uh, Facebook where it, it gave two children, uh, two children, two, two teenagers or 20-something, early 20s, maybe late teenagers, a rotary phone. And they said, try and use this. And, it was, and if you can find this on the Internet, find it. It's worth watching how long it takes them to figure out what it is and what you do with it. So that's the same sort of thing with postcards. However, they're still somewhat in our... Uh, in our, it, it's passed along. We still, we still have a sense of it. So my introduction to Korchak, as I said yesterday, was about 10 years ago involving this uh, international shared reading program, or at the time, it was the International Book uh, Sharing Project. And it was connected with Korchak. And before, because I, as a public school teacher, I have this sense of tremendous responsibility to you know, the public school system, and I can't have an agenda about what I want to do. I have to be clear about what my responsibility is to my, my, my district, my state, my, my students, and I want to find common ground, and I also want my kids to grow. And, and when I was asked to participate in this program, as luck would have it, my wife was taking students over uh, to uh, that, wasn't that the time when you were taking students to Israel? And I was able to meet with the schools that I was going to participate with, or the school that I would participate with, before I actually had my students uh, participate. So I walked around the school, met the teacher, and she had some students with me. And it was like, this was fascinating. It was wonderful. And it, again, it was a face-to-face -face relationship that was absolutely essential in beginning something that has gone on to I would say not just enrich my life, but uh, you know, enrich my students. Uh, more, more to that later. Uh, so when I went there, I made sure to go to the Ghetto Fighters Museum because they were uh, underwriting the project. They had a, 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 the, one of the directors of the museum was uh, directing the project on the Israeli side, and we had a, a, a director from Colorado uh, in America. And I bought the postcards, as I said. Uh, I found out that Korchak had these postcards. So I bought a facsimile set of postcards. And um, from this, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll show you some of those, what they look like. And it had an activity. And I, and, and I just filed that away in my mind. Again, like Wojciech said, file things away in your mind. It, you know, As a teacher, as a practitioner, as anything you do, file everything away in your mind. Because you, you'll find a place to use it. And I'm absolutely convinced that was what Korchak did. You know, f everything around him was, a, well, again, matchboxes. Everything around him was something 
a, a gateway for imagination, creativity, and a way to engage somebody in something. So as, as I, I learned briefly at that time about the, you know, mentioned about the court, it mentioned about the uh, postcards. We talked about the court uh, yesterday. That, that was a longer, that was a series of multi-years, multi-years from simulating, um, trying to uh, establish and get a sense of it going forward. The postcards, and this is essentially what, a court, what our court uh, looks like uh, in, in, in training, but the postcards. This is something I did from day one, at the end of the first year, uh, 10 years ago, with a, with a project. These are Korchak's postcards. And from my understanding and my limited reading into the history, I'm not a researcher, I'm a practitioner, uh, from the Ghetto Fighters House Museum, these are, you can see the cards. These are actual facsimiles of cards that left the orphanage because they were saved and, and they were also children who had graduated from the orphanage before. So they would, these would be um, materials that, uh, it, that lasted. So they're here. These are facsimiles, and this would be the writing on the back. And they were given as encouragement or to, to, to uh, well, let, me, let me read the, the actual writing. On some of the back of the cards, they would say things like 280 joint prayers for work at the orphanage. Woke up early in the morning 90 times. Therapy. Woke up early during summer, 90 times. Took care of 150 letter correspondence. Yearly chores, shower. Uh, woke up early during winter, 88 times. Woke up early during spring, 91 times. Do you hear something? It, there's an echo of, of the sense of these are internalized sense of, of taking track and accountability of your time and your numbers. Uh, Work at the orphanage. Work up a jury during autumn. Work at the 500th time. Yearly chores. Shower. Woke up during winter 98 times. Woke up early in the morning. Yearly chores uh, on work at the orphanage. Uh, and then one of them, the final this I have here, is what was given. Apparently, this was given a forget-me-not uh, to commemorate when a child would leave the orphanage. Is that correct? That is not something that I do not want to mischaracterize. So it's a forget-me-not, the flower. And it would be, uh, as, as Korchak said, these were, um, and I read it yesterday, it's, it, it's certainly uh, worth repeating. These, these are, <sighs> They're, they're, they're souvenirs, and, and, and some will lose them on life's road. Uh, some will treasure them. It, it's this idea that, you know, sometimes it's one of those things that you treasure and it's one of those things that you keep. So these, I'll leave these out a little bit so you can take a look at them. And right away, that stuck with me as something that was incredibly powerful because I have postcards. How many of you who have postcards kept postcards that you received? They're simple. They're pick, they they automatic, automatic, legally, you know, it, it, there's this idea of evidence. When you see something, you read it. They, it can refresh your memory. And it, you're able to read things because it will refresh your memory. A postcard is like a smell. You know, a smell can take you back. A sense can take you back to a time in your life, and automatically it overpowers you. And, and that's a connection. And right away, I figured at the end of my project. It was a year-long project. I wanted it to be a year-long project. I don't like projects uh, that, if it's important, I, I want to develop it. Now, I, I'm an English language arts teacher, so I teach yeah, I, I, a lot of things that I'm required to teach, you know, grammar, writing, um, nonfiction, fiction. And in addition to what the kids do, I have this book-sharing project where they 
interact and I spread it out over time because I figured that the, the, the historical context is terribly important, but there's also the personal context. So I don't overvalue one to the other, and they're young children. They don't need to dwell in horror, they, but they need to understand where they can connect. And the postcards was a very interesting way of dealing with it, and it's become um, a part of the court uh, in a different context that I discussed yesterday, where the postcards, um, there are cards that we now use to award uh, virtue as part of the court. Today, I want to talk about cards that you can use or that you can develop or that you can incorporate in uh, whether you're teaching or in something that you want to do to encourage somebody in the same way. So even if you're not a teacher. This is uh, what our card uh, look like. It's an evolution. Uh, OK, the story, Island on Bird Street, is, is connected to the lesson I want to teach. We're, it's, it's about a story about uh, a child who was in a fictional Polish ghetto during World War II waiting for his father. His, father's, uh, his mother's taken. His, his mother goes, walks away on the first page. His mother goes to meet somebody in one other section of the ghetto, and then she doesn't return. And then the father originally then is selected um, and, and taken. The child hides. And the story is about the child waiting, waiting as the ghetto is being reduced in size and, and um, towards the end. So he lives in, basically he lives in hope, and that keeps him going. And he has a friend, this, uh, he has this little, befriends this little mouse. And the, it, it's not a story that dwells in horror and, atro and atrocity except for the fact of separation. And I think that's incredibly age appropriate. You know, instead of dealing with the horrors of, 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 of transit or, or the camps, it deals with the actual horror of separating. As a parent, you know, that moment when a child is away from you for a fraction of a second, everything in your world stops and there's no horror that you can experience that is like it. And then all of a sudden you see the kid on the playground and say, like, imagine that never leaving. So I try and make sure that they understand age probe. That's why I, I want this to go uh, for a longer period of time. So let me give you, um, I'll take you through a way I built a lesson. So for those of you who are teachers, I have 10 packets. Those of you who are in the program, I'll, I'll focus to make sure that you, had, and this is very, very focused, not like yesterday. I didn't just give you a, a, a dump. Your presenter, let me, let me hold on. Let me make sure that the, make sure my practitioners have Okay. Sure. Sure. Just for chocolates. Just for chocolates. Okay, and I'm going to have to hold on to one. I just want to make sure that I, 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 I deal with it in a way uh, to give you something at the, you know, while we're doing this. So the island on Bird Street. I, if you're a, an English teacher, if you're a teacher, you're responsible for having kids to write and respond. How do you get kids to write and respond? How do you get them to focus on the things that you have in your state standards? What I have for one, of the, and it's a handout in the back uh, pocket. Every handout that I'm going to go through is in the back pocket. This is what I use. And you could scratch out the island on Bird Street and put whatever story you want to put there. We often have to teach kids plot. And plot is a series of events that happen and are arranged. And they're in a meaningful way. And there's a purposeful arrangement. Like you have a story in a book. If you take all the pages out of a book, shuffle them up, respine the book, it's a different story. There's a reason why they're arranged a certain way. And that's the plot. The events follow one after another. So we are, off, we are required to teach children basic steps in a plot, meaningful things. So if they read a chapter, I have them identify key scenes and events quickly. This side, what I like them to do is, is put something in here that's a picture, a symbol. I always want three-dimensional stuff. And I'll get to that uh, towards the end when I show you how it's evolved. Uh, something quick. I don't want them to focus because I'm not grading their art. I'm grading their idea and what they want to put in there. I don't mind stick figures, but they got to be stick figures doing something creative. And there always has to be a quotation from the story. 
because I'm required to have them analyze text and apply text. There's a reason why I made that box that size. What size does that box look like? It looks like a postcard. Uh, and I fanatically keep everything. So, and you always have to plan. So this is a helpful thing. I would suggest if you're ever reading any story, you have something like this for kids, you know, and you have to have them mark things as they read, this is a great template. I use it for a, a variety of things. Um, I <laughs> gladly let you use it. There's, there's uh, no copyright, it's mine, so there's no, <laughs> there's, there's no issue you can use it. Um, I would encourage you to use it. This is how it looks in practice. Kids know I'm not grading them, and yet this is what I get. You know, this is, this is a whole range, this is not one year. This is from chapter one. Uh, let's see, with the other chapters. Uh, now, obviously, I have a variety. I, I took some stuff, but I have a lot of postcards to show you, so it's not, you know, I, I don't mind. It's just interesting, the point of view, interesting how they view stuff. Um, we're not supposed to have guns and things like that. I, you know, common sense has to prevail. So this is what it would look like. Questions about this? Can you see using this in anything that you do with a story? It's a helpful tool. Um, next, if you look, the, I gave you another handout, it's called Traits and Conflicts. Again, for uh, language arts teachers or anybody, I guess if you're teaching social studies or something where you have to provide any analysis at any level, you would always have to identify something, you would have to provide a quotation, and you would have to uh, have, the kids would have to give some sense of what it means. And not a connection necessarily to themselves, but an explanation of the text and an explanation of themselves. So I encourage them, that's a required thing that we have to do, so that will go hand in hand as they read the story. Um, I've, I, I've used these and, and developed and, and, and you know, tweaked them over the years. I mean, it's, 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 it's really uh, something that is, is part of, of actual teaching practice, and those of you uh, who teach, Whatever you're doing, it's the same thing. You know, it, it, it's, it's, this is another way of, of building the wheel, another way of, of, of doing something that really does work. And I'm in a public school, it's, it's, it's kids of varieties of abilities. This is for, for anything. Now, the next hand I give you, it's the third one. It looks very similar, and there's another box. This is, uh, again, I like this for language arts, but this is great for social studies because I use this one for nonfiction. I give them, a, there are a variety of strategies you can use to have kids read nonfiction. I didn't go into teaching to teach nonfiction. However, I'm required to do about 65% nonfiction, articles, analysis, and, you know, training as a lawyer is helpful in a sense that, yeah, I understand that it's part of the writing, it's part of analysis. But, and critical thinking, but you know, fiction and stories and dreams and poetry, that, that's, that's what I love. But you know, nobody's gonna pay me to talk about what I love. So I have to do what's important and, and, and I have to find what matters and what will matter in the life of my children and I think this works for them. So I take whatever article you wanna read, put a little bullet there, have them write text. Because any time you provide a quotation, automatically, you know, you're having a kid focus on text. Then, next to it, some response to the text. This is very good for nonfiction. And then below, again, some r representation. I use this in the book sharing project because as they read each chapter, I'll sprinkle in little bits and pieces of, of um, testimonies, uh, primary uh, uh, witness accounts, children accounts. This one was something or a Polish child. These were, were kids of life before the war, life before, and and there were little bits and pieces. And I have them do a little bit and respond to it very quickly. And it's and, and it's not, it's not the sense of doing a research paper, but they are reading nonfiction and they are learning. And the picture, I mean, I, I really like the person, the person's art who puts that in there. You get a whole variety of interesting things. I have also paired nonfiction, had them do a poem, 
and they read, um, you know, The Little Smuggler by uh, Lazarus, you, the, and it's in, in Yad Vashem. It's a, it's a picture of a, it's a, it's a poem about a, a, a child who's smuggling in the ghetto and says, you know, who, who you know, it, it, and if, if this game in the end, if this game, in this, it, how it doesn't work, if, if who will feed you mother of mine if I'm gone. And it's, it's posted in, in Yad Vashem, but it's something that you, you could also put in poetry and have them respond to poetry, like put down metaphor, simile, have them say, identify, I, where there I said something like here, I used personification foreshadowing. And I said, um, this was a different poem. I think I used a poem about a uh, family album. It was a photo of a family album at, at Hanukkah and uh, pictures of people. And there was a part in the story where in uh, Island Bird Street when the child was running around and, 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 and scurrying and finding, and he saw, um, Photographs, you know, just littered on the streets when the ghetto was cleared, and then so I had this picture of a photo album, and it was a very powerful poem, and so I had them respond to it, and on the back, which was clean, I, I made them um, respond to some literary technique, whatever. I mean, these are form you just you just whatever the ideas are, you use them to help you out, and the key, I think, in the Island on Bird Street, and why it works for children, and why this is so powerful and so age appropriate, is it focuses on hope. It focuses on the idea that the child lives in hope. He does, he's fearful, but he's a doer. But he lives in hope, and you know, you know, in his case, his, you know, he, his father does return. But for, for children in seventh and eighth grade, I don't need them to dwell in fear. I need them to focus on, on, on hope and, and connect that to their life, that things are tough, and, and I don't simulate anything at all. It's just things are tough, and people feel it, and yet there's hope. And I think I, I probably, I think I put in the materials, the poem by uh, Emily Dickinson was a gorgeous, powerful poem. You could do a lot with that. Again, community goodwill, what a mighty force. Use the postcards to build something. We talked about the meeting yesterday. So this is my first foray into the postcards. What I did was sort of odd, and I gave you a, um, I gave you two of my I think two or three of my postcard projects, I want to make sure where the one, one was in the, where it says postcards project, and it was in the folder, and it was a staple. This was the first one I did quite some time ago, and I took a postcard, made a sense of where you would put a quotation. I gave them a template. You always give kids templates, an explanation, a trait, and some statement. And in the back, in this packet, again, what I said about was very important. When you do something, look at your school. Look at your school culture. Look at what people value in your school community because you want to build on it. We were really focusing on giving the kids a planner that had bullying prevention strategies in it, in the back. So what I did was I took the bully prevention strategies from a program that we did, Olveus uh, Bullying Prevention, we did that for, during that time, and I made that part of the assignment. So at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the period uh, of, of the, the, the period of the book, the final thing, they had to find uh, these uh, match uh, examples of these traits and these qualities and these bully prevention strategies in the text and mark them and find somebody to celebrate who, who showed that and connected to the text. The other thing that I did, which was sort of odd, and you know, I, I, I've since changed what I did, I had the kids collect postcards. They collected 200 postcards. Why would I have them collect 200 postcards? Random number, we all, we dwell in numbers. Why 200? Hint, Korchak, the children. So they did 200 postcards. Their counterparts in Israel collected 200 postcards. They sent us their postcards. We sent us our postcards. We then took their cards, and we put our material on their cards, and then we distributed them, one to their partner, and, uh, or whatever. We, I had them do quite, I think, whatever. This was a lot. I mean, I... I think I've mellowed over the years. But there was a lot uh, that they had to do, and they distributed them. And it was a really interesting project. And I, I got, 
very, you know, a mixture of snail mail, uh, online, and, and tactile postcards. And it was just strange, but the kids really responded. And what was neat about it is if you see these Gettysburg things, a couple of years later, our kids, our eighth graders, go on a Gettysburg trip. Um, I had kids give me postcards from Gettysburg where they wrote stuff to me. And they said, oh, you want postcards? Yeah, they just said, here, I want to, you know. So it was kind of a gift that, that, that gave back because they, they understood. You could tell these, these were Israeli postcards. Um, and I was able to keep a few. I didn't have a lot because those were all distributed. This is what it looked like on the back, according to the template. And you know, this is something uh, in the initial stages. Now, what I had them do is your picture where it had the um, island on Bird Street and it had the square. A lot of times I want to see, uh, you know, I have in my mind what I want and we'll see what we can get from kids and what they can do. And they can fill in the creativity. Same size, I figured they do for every chapter, I will keep, when they hand them in to grade them, I will keep everything they've done for each chapter. And at the end of the period, at the end of the year, they'll have had pictures for chapter one. There are 20 chapters in the story. Uh, and the number of kids I had in class, I had hundreds of different pictures of varying quality. So what I did was I made photocopies of it towards the end of the year. They didn't know I collected all this stuff and I had them make their own postcards from it. I gave them a stack of everything and they could choose whichever ones they wanted and those were the backs of the postcards with quotations. So those, those are actual, they made their own postcards and on the back, that's when they started using the uh, pillars of character, the six pillars of character, responsibility, fairness, caring, respect, citizenship, uh, and trustworthiness. And you can see a variety of different pictures, of different things they chose. Kids didn't only choose their postcards. You know, like they, I think they, I forget how many they had to choose. Um, they, they picked quite a few, they, they were just interested. It was sort of a grab bag, and, and it's sort of weird that they were all kept, but it's because I, you know, I knew that this was a useful thing. So these are some more of them. Some of these I was able to keep. Some, a couple over, you know, they would give some to me. Some they would say, okay, here, and I could make copies of them. So this would be the back, and this would be the front. And if you can see in your own practice, you can do that to either coworkers, people that you want. You can give them something, and I guarantee they will treasure it because it's from you uh, to them, uh, and it's about your relationship. But this was specifically with students, and again, I'll, I'll note how I required it to, to, to be built. So here we have some really interesting ones. And again, I didn't just take the best, I just took what I got. So this is beautifully done, and you note every now and then when a kid sees something done a certain way, they'll, they'll copy the other kids doing it, so they wanted to type it, they wanted to make it nicer. These are different years, and these are more of the pictures. And I let them also choose some other things that they wanted, compassion, you know, that was, it was, you know, and I don't think tolerance was one of the pillars of character, although it probably should be, because I think if, to me, <laughs> tolerance, that's the answer pretty much to everything. Uh, then, it was just, a, I, I think I let them choose from a variety of things. So here, now we're moving into the lesson in the, in the, in the, um, the actual, if you look at the packet where it has uh, the postcard picture. This is um, a signature, what I would call, if you read, if you look through, it's a signature, a collection at the end of a unit. So the island on Bird Street, the scar, and a story, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. Does anybody know the story, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry? Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry is a, is a, is a novel about the Mississippis uh, in 1930 during Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow South. And it's a black family that owned some land, which was sort of rare, lived with shop, uh, sharecroppers, and it was all about basic racism, but the dignity of the family. And it was a very beautiful story. And it ends up, the woman, Mildred Taylor, wrote all about this family from uh, a, a long time in history. So it's a story, it's a core story in our seventh grade and it's a novel and I think as um, 
background for To Kill a Mockingbird, with which you know, kids read in high school. This is a powerful foundation because you can teach segregation, civil rights. You teach all sorts of wonderful things. They're introduced to Thurgood Marshall. They're introduced to Brown Board of Education. All the things you need, you know, separate but equal, plus Ferguson, all the things you can give them, and you're still doing it in language arts, so you're supporting uh, 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 civics. Um, what I had them do, and you can read the assignment, this would be helpful to you, um, is make three types of cards. Partner postcards, community cards with Roll of Thunder, and defender cards, the SCAR. Have you been exposed this week to the SCAR by Korchuk? It's a two-page short story, which is, I gave, it's in the front, um, it's in the first pocket, uh, it's a wonderful short story about a school, a teacher, and a child uh, in, uh, in, in between the wars. And it's a remarkable story from what you can do with it. It's only two pages. I, I, uh, and what I had the kids do, obviously the kids have finished reading Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which is a novel. They finished reading uh, Island on Bird Street, which is a novel. This is a year. We've done, we read a little bit of Korchak. And so this is a, 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 you know, one of the, the a, a major project at the end, the unit ending. And at the unit ending thing, this is what they were required to do, uh, make postcards to celebrate, identify uh, defenders in their community. That would be for the SCAR because it's a, it, and you have, I gave you the short story, and I'm, please use it. It's a wonderful story. And there's also not in our town in Montana, there was a, a um, an interesting little, you can find that in the, uh, uh, it's easily to find as a nonfiction it, uh, about a, uh, a town's response to racism. Then Roll of Thunder, a wonderful, wonderful novel that we, we built up with, and then the Island on Bird Street that they sent to their partner. And I put in the lesson plan all the state standards, I put in all the objectives, everything you would do to it, you have any question about it, you ask me. It's, it's methodical, it's, it's completely comprehensive, and there's also a, an absolutely um, <laughs> overly done template <laughs> to make these. So you can see how they're done. And I even gave you, um, uh, to show you the, I just found a postcard the same size as the one on the, on the sheet that I gave you. I just copied on the internet and I made this. Uh, and then I have the kids just glue them on and they make their cards and they show up. I have, I have plenty of the copies to, to, to show you so it, it lasts. Now, this is what I got. And based on the rubric, I didn't let them do two-dimensional art. I made sure I wrote down specifically what you were required to do. With students, you have to tell them, no matter how bright they are, you have to tell them what they're required to do because they will say, hey, what do I need to get an A? And other kids will say, what's somebody else doing or whatever, I'll just do it. But my standard line is I'll take a photo of LeBron James and put it on, a LeBron card. It's a LeBron card. So no LeBron cards. Um, had to be three-dimensional, had to deal with it, and they became, I have, I, I, I was able to get um, quite a few of them. They had to give their partner cards to their partners uh, um, at the time they were done, so I do not have those. But I have ones that they let me keep that were community. They let me borrow them, and I do have to return them but I can show them to you. Um, they open up. Um, this is them responding to their, their school. We, when I went over uh, two years ago, I went back to one of the schools and that we wrote, we gave them, so this is a school we work with in Israel. It's outside of Tel Aviv. These are the students getting their postcards from my kids. So there's an actual real thing. Um, and I have worked with this school, now this will be my fourth year. What is the range of how old? This is 7th and 8th, and I've worked with ninth graders in the school as well with another project. And I've worked with two teachers, and I'm working, and, and I love them both. They're, they're remarkable. They're, they're um, again, partnerships. Korchak has enabled me to make partnerships that has helped me teach other people. My goal is teaching kids, and Korchak has helped me teach kids. It has given me energy and inspired me to do what I do for the reasons why it should be done. And that's why, that's why he did it. And 
it needed to be done. So these are the kids, they're reading them. They were, they were really happy when it went through. I mean, you know, these are middle school kids. What are they going to do? They're, you know. And this one, this a newer teacher that I work with now, and, and she's, she's great, and I was able to go there. Um, that was the principal on, next, on my right, and the two teachers together. I've, I work with them. Now, see, these are some of the cards. I'll show you um, uh, quickly what they look like. Respect. Your respect defends the honor of the school from the scar. Don't bully anyone, children, neither him nor anyone. Defend the honor of the school. Let no one from this school, Sharpsville, Korchak didn't say Sharpsville, from this school carry into the world, into life, such a scar as mine, neither on one's head nor on one's soul. Then the Pataki stuff, the kids have to connect this to the novel. So they connect it to something in the novel, and, and they would go on. Uh, again, this one did the scar as well or pardon me, not the novel, the short story, they connect it. Responsibility. This is the front and back of this card. Citizenship. Again, from the scar. I think a lot of kids gave their partners the stuff from the island on Bird Street. I don't have many of those. Your citizenship makes Sharpsville a better place, but if this quote demonstrates the city, I mean, you, they, they say what you want them to say. Uh, scar. See, the scar they, they kept. That was one they were probably giving to their family because the, uh, um, I made them give the island on Bird Street. Basically, you know, of the, most of them, they went to the family. Again, the scar. Respect. Trust. Responsibility. Ah, he got one for Roll of Thunder. Your leadership is an inspiration to the friends. So it's high-level thinking. If you, you know, we had a previous superintendent. Everything was we had to do. I don't know if you, if you've been uh, exposed to this, this horror of depth of learning where you have to get where they put numbers on it. You have to do D, 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 D O K, blah, 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 and he wants to see everything moving towards web. Okay. Uh, Everything that's here is the highest level of critical thought for a middle school kid or, you know, high school, where you have to look at things, combine them, find text, create something from it, use different materials. So again, you do stuff like this, you won't clash with your district's uh, uh, goals and your district's requirements and your own responsibilities. However, I think there's always a higher there's a higher calling that you need to understand, and that's the kid. And this stuff becomes more important. Yeah, I love this one. Trustworthiness. Again, the scar. Caring. See, the scar. See, I don't have any, I don't think I have any island on Bird Street from, from this group. Because they, they had to give those to their partner. Or that was the easy one for them to give to their partner. And Roll of Thunder deals with kids going to school, black kids having to go to school and, and facing um, their own school, but being taunted by the white school bus, whatever. It's a wonderful book. But again, it's building powerful, age-appropriate uh, background knowledge for To Kill a Mockingbird. Trustworthiness. This one opened up. This one was uh, remarkable. And she did Island Birchery. She let me keep this one. I, I mean, keep it. She let me use it. I've used it a couple of times. I love this one. <laughs> Citizenship, Roll of Thunder. Some kids really respond to art. And again, when you prepare them with your, your boxes and the, the things, nothing that you're asking them to do is new. What I love about the other activity with the, where they did the black and white stuff where they just drew it is all of a sudden they had a whole bunch of them. They didn't have to go collect them. They've made their own. They were all, they were all their own uh, stuff. Okay, this was th this year. This year I had a seventh grade class, very, very difficult class, very um, uh, not, not uh, prepared, not, um, you know, it, it, we had the challenge, we're facing challenges everybody has. So this was the final project in the Island on Bird Street. And it's, it's where you look at a wall. Imagine a wall separating the ghetto from the Polish side, and it created two separate worlds, the, the, the side that was enclosed in the ghetto and the Polish side without. What walls, literal and figurative, do we need to look beyond in our own schools and community to help make uh, 
a more tolerant and respectful world. What more do you want from kids to reflect on? What causes those walls to be built? How do we overcome them? What happens once you get to know the world on the other side of the world? Well, on the other side of the wall. <laughs> it's not like I, I said, let's have the wall be the major point in two years uh, of our discussion. But this was something that we look at with the island on Bird Street. So look familiar? Look familiar? Look familiar? Look familiar? What I did was I took one of these, drew some lines on it, and said, you're going to do what's behind the wall, what's an obstacle. It took me all of 30 seconds. Okay? And then you ultimately will have, again, what Korchak enabled me, what, what he, he gave me the parameters. He gave me um, the script, as somebody said yes, sir. He gave me the script but trusted me as the child to think, how can I enlarge it? How can I enlarge it? But for me, how can I enlarge it for the people that I'm required to enlarge it for? Because that's what it's about. You know, what, can we, what can we do? So what will, what will come of this? And this was just uh, uh, last month. So a lot of times, I let them use guns. I let the, I, you know, I, I'm whatever. They can, they can tell me that they, you know. So somebody said, okay, I'm going to use a knife. But that's the struggle. That's the fight. And and this was the outside. Spread it out. All the things you want them to show. And then when they write about the wall and its connection to themselves, then your heart breaks. I read again some of them this morning. Um, I have to send these. Uh, I send these, uh, when I leave uh, and go back home, I have to put these up and send them to their partners in Israel. And I read about people talking about the walls in their life, walls in their lives related to family, not getting along, people talking about politics and fighting with each other. Uh, I read about a girl who uh, was her height, she's tall, and what she has to deal with, okay, it's great for volleyball, we, but, but the bullying and can't people just stop? I read about there was a, we don't have very much diversity at all. And in this class, I had a black girl who wrote about makeup she puts on so that when she goes home, she, people think she's excessively dramatic, but then she uh, goes home and people look like her so she feels better. And I had a uh, um, um, girl who wrote about being Mexican in, in a community. And her, when she goes out with her family, she can't speak Spanish because people look at them. I have the cards. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm a little careful about that one because I'm going to mail those. And, and you know, their names uh, are, are, are there. But their stories will break your heart. And I have the other ones where, you know, why can't my family just get along? You know, so they say, I didn't ask them to write about um, Nazism. I didn't ask them to write about stuff and, and write about how victim. I asked them to write about what walls exist in their life, connect what they read to, to what they live. And I got stuff about boys saying, you know, well, you know I'm not really that great. I'm not, I'm not ugly, but I'm not hot either. And it's not like I'm popular and I'm short. And, and they, they write about this stuff, and it absolutely... Is, is phenomenal, and, and, and you realize this, this is what's in front of you. And then these are one, I, I, she said I can do this. This is it's worth reading, but I'm not going to just give you this. I want you to see you're going to get the kid who says, um, you know, why can't we just stop with racism, and why can't we just, you know, if people just were a little bit more tolerant, we could, you know, could end some of this stuff and get along with each other. And, you know, and by the way, I'm not that popular, and that's okay because I'm sort of weird. But, yeah, you know, and then you get that. But then you have kids who say, imagine there being a wall. This wall separates you from humanity. On one side is beautiful heaven, angels, your dreams coming to life. On the other side is fire, broken glass, anything you can think of that's holding you back. One wall that needs to be changed in my life would be the one of my family's. Another wall of me would be not being able to truly connect with people. And that first paragraph, what do you see? As an educator, what do you see? I mean, as a human, you know, obviously you see you know, things that make you cry, but as a human, as an educator, what do you see? Well, it, it's a girl. Yeah, it's a girl who is, is incredibly, she's, she's really good, but, but what do you see in terms of like education? This is the end of the year. 
the first paragraph. Well, yeah. On the other side is fire, broken glass, anything you can think of that's holding you back. This is a Sharpsville, Pennsylvania, so no exposure to anything. Any ideas? Crystal Macht. She wrote a poem for a Holocaust uh, uh, competition uh, a few months ago. That's stuck in her mind. She internalized what you should internalize at that level from the Holocaust. The breaking of glass, the destruction of property, the taking and separating of families. I didn't, you know, they weren't exposed to stuff they couldn't. It, that's something that she will deal with, and she knows that's the horror. Uh, Not everyone. I think he should explain. Uh, yeah. Good. It's a, it's a segue to this. Children, wolves, and light. Uh, when, uh, when my introduction to Tatiana and the Korchak Association here came through the, 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 the play, the, um, po, uh, the, the Amichai Pardo, and he was brought to Pittsburgh a few years ago by a group, uh, the, the Classrooms Without Borders. So when we went to the uh, presentation, not only did I meet the person who played Korchak, I also, she also told me, read this story about the children of Wilson Lane. Children of Wilson Lane is about the kinder transport, which right before this time of Kristallnacht, which is in uh, 1938, the, which in German means the night of, essentially the night of broken glass, what happened was they noticed that things were getting really bad, Germany, Austria, uh, and they put children, they were advocates in England, to take children on trains and get them out of Austria and Germany. And they sent, what is it, about 10,000, I think, ultimately were able to go, and it ended at Kristallnacht. The problem was after that, uh, the, 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 the Brits didn't want to take anymore because the kids were old enough to get jobs, and it was a problem because coming in, um, even though the times were horrific um, uh, for the kids, they, they just didn't have room, and they, they, they said, we can't take anymore. Oh, you have your echoes. But so she said, we're doing this book. We want you to read this book. Um, we will give books to your class. And then we have this program of the person coming. And so um, that's uh, the connection there. And I had, <laughs> I had the kids this current year read the book, The Children of Wills and Lane. And they communicated by card to my current kids who were doing the book sharing. I let them do cards. They had to pick, uh, take an object that means something to you, write about it, and send it as a postcard to your seventh grade, the younger kids. So it's scaffolding, you know, a little scaffolding learning. Notice uh, dog tags, childhood toys, a blanket. This is the stuff they would take. When the kids went on the kinder transport from Germany and Austria to, uh, through the Netherlands to uh, England, they, they couldn't take much. So they t you know, the girl in the story took a little photo of her mom. So these kids, what would you take? I hate, the, I hate the things where you have to simulate any kind of thing, but it was just like, I'd say, what would matter to you? What would you take um, if you had to leave? And then you would see some have religious symbol, you know, things that matter from religion, things that matter from, oh, I mean, you, you, when you read about them, they're just unbelievable. Uh, even shoes to, to show that they, they like to run. And this is what the class who had already done book sharing, this is how they wrote. So if you see growth as a teacher, this is growth. Extensions, and this is why I want you to uh, incorporate postcards in some way. These are extensions. My current class that is not, that didn't do postcards, they got a group of, of greeting cards. My mom gave me, she collected a greeting cards over the years, and she said, you can use these. So you came from uh, hundreds of them. So I said, oh, OK, I'll use them. You know, use what you have. So what I did was I had the, I have the, they wrote, my eighth grade wrote to my seventh grade. My seventh grade had the cards, and this is my seventh grade that wrote back to my eighth grade. So I have, they, they, able, they gave me some of those because the eighth grade let me borrow them. These were the cards. They're not postcards. These were greeting cards, but inside it was the same idea. And we understood because of postcards. Thanks, Mom, for all the cards. Because the kids, if you ask kids to get you cards now, it's, it becomes difficult. They can't get them. But these are extensions. And this is all, this is all from Korchak. I mean, this is all from, you know, Korchak and my mom, really, 
making me understand that you can, you know, that kids need to be tactile. They need to be touched. Yeah, I'll talk at them forever, and I'll do all sorts of stuff, but, you know, you have to... You have to give them things to touch and give them things to create and give them color and give them bits and pieces to choose. And, you know, they think they're doing great art. And I think this is terribly important. Um, there was a quote yesterday that matters, I think, from George Bernard Shaw, who was the, uh, uh, he was an Irish player. And it was, you know, you don't stop playing because you grow old. You grow old because you stop playing. This is another one. I always say I like to, to begin and end with Korchak. I think I'm beginning and ending here with Korchak. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. So the harder I work, the more I live. What I see in that, and to me that's very personal, because what I see in that is uh, I honestly do not like to contemplate July, you know, May, April, May, June, July, August in, in, in the Warsaw Ghetto. But what I feel is this tireless, uh, indefatigable force of nature going on, finding and scrounging every possible thing he could, extra food, extra this, extra that, shaming people to give them something for his kids, whatever he could do, using his body is racked with disease and, and, and exhaustion and knowledge of what is coming. And yet, as every, every second, it's becoming more and more of a, you know, of a call to us to live our lives meaningfully and impact others because that's how you, you, know, you, you create a legacy that goes on. And what I think is important about the legacy is like yesterday with the kids who, who owned the court, when they were, were, I hope some of you read some of what the kids said in that news article. You can read in that kids who genuinely felt that court was my creation. And when I come back, you better well have a good court because you know, we spent a lot of time making that work. And those kids, they lived it, and, and that's the thing. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't see this connected uh, uh, as, as much, but in my mind, I, I feel that. I, I feel that for it, and you can use these. If you're a teacher, if you're an administrator, if you're something, if you want to give somebody not just positive reinforcement, but something that's life-affirming and something that has uh, a tremendous uh, value for them to keep, you control what you give somebody to keep. You know, you don't, you can try a million things. You know, they keep one of them, so they got something. You know, it's like with the kids. A lot of kids keep this stuff. So it, it, it's an important, you know, these are tools. Again, with, with Korchak, you have, the, you have a toolkit, and, and with your bets and with your uh, other things that he did and practiced, those are doors in a hallway to a kid. You know, open it up, try one, it doesn't work, change it. I try the bets, I, I do it differently, I do it in ways that work for me. I think Wojciech's way is better. I'll, I'll improve, I'll try and use his way and not just, you know, whatever. I, I'm not trying to, to do a blueprint of Korchak, but I'm trying to follow in, in that legacy because that legacy is, is, is what I think we ought to. I mean, the kids need it, so. When you, when you do these things and you put them in there, they're not just for kids, but they really, you know, they really are uh, essential for education. And you have a full lesson plan. You have full use of, of any of that stuff you want to use. Um, you can do this for novels. You can, do, you can use some of the questions for novels. There's something else in there uh, about a poem with Langston Hughes and stuff like that. I, do that with, I, I just put that in there because that was part of the lesson. Um, if anything that you want, um, you can find through Tatiana, you can contact me and, and ask for clarification about the stuff. Um, I, I don't have time to, 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 uh, uh, to, to have you handle the postcards, but I do, my, they're, they're with my wife up there. I, I cart them around all the time. But, so. Okay. Come up and definitely check. I'm, I'm believe it or not, believe it or not, one hour, I'm done. I'm Hi, everyone. Um, we're delighted to be invited here. Um, we're going to... I didn't realize until um, 
I was reading a little bit about Korczak, that we have so much um, in common with him and that he was way ahead of his time and a lot of what the work that we do um, aligns with. Can people hear me? Yeah? It's right here. Yeah, you, you can use the microphone. I'm, it kind of okay, I'm, okay. Okay, I'm just worried about being like, you know, moving the, the mouse and everything. That, um, okay. Um, so, um, my name is Gemma, um, and I am the program coordinator with the Dalai Lama Center. Um, and I have worked in the area of child advocacy and policy and welfare for the last 20 years. Um, as you can tell, maybe tell, I have a different accent. So I'm Irish, so I was delighted to see an Irish quote um, from George Bernard Shaw a little while ago. Um, I've been living in Canada, Canada though for the last 10 years. I worked in a university in psychology um, back in Ireland. Um, and my role at the DLC, which is the um, short for the Dalai Lama Center, provides me with the opportunity to work um, at a broad systems level um, with adults well positioned to positively influence children's lives to help build supportive environments um, for children to flourish. Um, so that's um, what we do. We work with adults who work with children. We actually don't work directly with children. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, before I, we start, I just wanted to do something with you that we quite often do at the beginning of our workshops, which is one of the, our programs. Um, we run many workshops, and I'll talk about that in a minute too. But first of all, I wanted to do just a little mindfulness exercise with you. You've been sitting for quite a many, few hours at this point. So I want everybody just to Sit comfortably in their chairs. If you're holding anything, maybe put it down. Rest your hands on your legs or on the table. And just relax your body. And I'm just going to do a five senses exercise. So some of you may have done this already with your students if you're a teacher. Um, Okay, so first of all, I'm going to ask you to notice five things in the room that maybe you wouldn't normally notice. So maybe a crack in the ceiling, something on the wall, on the floor. It's a beautiful cracks, no cracks. <laughs> so it's just five things. Can you look at five things that you wouldn't ordinarily pick out? And secondly, can you notice four things that you can feel? So maybe the material of your clothes, how your hand is resting on your leg maybe or on the table. Maybe you can feel air blowing. Are there four things that you notice that you can feel? And now can you attend to three things that you hear? Might be somebody moving or the air con or a door. This one might be a bit, little bit more difficult. Two things that you can smell. So there may not be too many different things in here to smell, but yeah, you may have worn perfume this morning, or deodorant. You may smell the laundry detergent on your clothes. And finally, one thing you can taste. Some of you just may have had some chocolate, so you may taste chocolate in your mouth, or you just maybe just notice the taste that you have in your mouth. Okay, so many of you may have done a mindfulness exercise before. Um, and do you, do you know what mindfulness is? Yeah, 
So it's being able to pay attention to the present without any judgment for what is happening. Um, and helping children to focus on what's happening right now is very, very beneficial, as it is for ourselves as well, for adults. And it has many um, benefits. It boosts your immunity. It helps you to be more empathetic and compassionate. Um, it protects you against um, heart attacks and various other heart, um, health conditions. So there's many things that you can um, that it can help with. So we encourage teachers, anybody working with um, or caring for children, that it's one very easy thing to do throughout the day to get, and there's very lots of different ways. You can get kids just to maybe eat a grape and mindful eating, just put the grape in their mouths and think about and chew it and think about the taste and the texture and that kind of thing, or go outside and walk on the grass. So there's lots of very simple things to get children to be mindful throughout the day that can help um, bring them to the present, to attend, to focus. Um, so that's just something that we quite often start with, with our um, workshops. And I just wanted to do that with you today. Um, I'm not sure this is working, so, okay. We tested this right before, and it worked, I promise. I don't know if this is an issue, because I don't know now I have access to this. I just have to say deny, but... Oh, there you go. How did you get? How did you get that? It's still not working. There you go. Okay, I just have to click, click on this. Okay. I don't think it's. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm just. Um. Pardon? Do you need to play that? Um, yeah, you know what, I'm going to, I'll just play it in one second. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education, um, our mission is to educate the hearts of children by informing, inspiring, engaging the communities around them. Um, and we don't deliver programs, as I said, directly to children um, and youth because our philosophy is that powerful ingredient to promoting social and emotional development is relationships. So we look for places where children and youth already have rich relationships in the community, um, at home and in schools, and we work with adults who support children in those environments. Um, so we are compa a capacity building organization um, and our reach goes much further if we work with the adults um, rather than the, with the children. Um, so I'm going to just show you a quick video that will give you um, a good idea and set the scene for what we do. When a child is born, we do everything we can to protect them, nurture them, love them. A child's heart and mind are fragile. As they grow, we want to teach them everything we know. We send them to school to fill their minds with wonderful knowledge, to give them the tools they need for life. At school, they get a taste of what things are like in the world outside. There is friendship, romance, disappointment, embarrassment, discrimination, and bullying. But are the tools we give them enough to prepare them for this world? We have an enormous responsibility and an amazing opportunity. If we truly want to prepare them for the world outside, we must also educate the heart. Because to navigate the world outside with compassion, acceptance, and tolerance, we need to teach them compassion, acceptance, and tolerance. This can begin in our schools and it can start today. It can happen at hockey practice, dance class, at day camps and music lessons. And it's already happening around the world with astonishing results. 
If we want our children to grow into socially and emotionally capable young people, we must ask for a balanced education that puts importance on educating both the mind and the heart. So I don't know if any of you would have recognized the, the man's voice. He's a Canadian spoken word poet called Shane Coison, who um, spoke at the um, closing ceremony for the um, Olympics, the Winter Olympics here a few years ago. Um, sorry, I keep forgetting. <laughs> I haven't used a mic before. Um, and Shane actually was bullied as a, a child, so he... Um, is an advocate for um, anti-bullying um, and he happened to be in our offices when um, we were making this video and he asked could he lend his voice to that so it was really nice and of course it was also where um, a, a non-profit um, without huge resources so this was kindly donated as well the animation um, to us um, and it's, I think it's a very powerful video and I think it's did anybody begin to think about times when their hearts were educated can you think of a time or a person who educated your heart, who touched your heart. Yeah, I'm sure we all can um, think of someone. And what's really important, I think, to, to know is that we all have the potential to be that person for somebody else. And it's never, it's never too late. Um, so what we do is we share and translate the science and the research of social-emotional development and we work collaboratively, collaboratively with others to create tools and resources to help those who care for and about children. Um, and as you noticed, our, we got our name, the Dalai Lama Center. Um, we were co-founded by His Holiness, who has visited Vancouver um, a lot um, and he has said it is vital that when educating our children's brains that we do not neglect to educate their hearts um, and that's where our mission has come from he's a very secular man we are a non-profit we are non-religious um, and we are not affiliated with any political organization um, and he um, believes that there's a lot of information out there about social and emotional development that we um, can share um, and he thought it was beneficial to have a center that could, could translate that science um, and um, information. So that is what we do. Um, and I know that, I, is it Korczak? Sorry, I don't know if I'm... Korczak. Um, he pretty much, I think, knew this a long time ago, that we need to educate children's hearts. And he um, has said that we um, need to have a holistic education. Um, where we also focus on the emotional, social emotional development of children. And that's pretty much what our approach is as well. Um, and His Holiness very much thought that this is an issue in North America. And that's why the center was set up here, is because he has said that there is an over, um, too much focus on academic achievement and not on the social emotional development of children. Um, so we don't spend enough time developing the hearts of children or helping children to develop their hearts. And that, what we mean by that is the way that we feel and relate to one another. Um, so in fact, heart and mind learning are interconnected. So there was a study by Castle, a meta-analysis, back in 2011, I think, um, and um, they found that there were significant benefits um, from deliberately teaching social, social and emotional um, development in schools. And that inc included um, increasing academic scores by 11 percentile points. 
So the um, argument that, oh, we don't need to spend time on those kind of like soft skills, they're not important, we just need to focus on kids getting, doing well in school um, and getting good grades. Um, our argument is that actually when you focus on children's um, hearts and help them to get along with others and um, to solve problems peacefully, to be alert and engaged, to be compassionate and kind, then they will do better in life. They will um, perform better academically um, and they will be more successful in many ways when, once they have those social skills. Okay, so we are not attempting to have perfectly Zen children. Um, I know quite often teachers um, say, oh, you're just putting, it's just more pressure, it's more added pressure, you're just trying to create these Zen, um, but as kids, we're, this is not what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, we're not trying to add pressure, we're trying to, um, and what we're saying is, um, we want to embrace joy. This kid is the epitome of what we're aiming for. And we want all children to be present and engaged and joyful and to enjoy close relationships. Um, we believe and we know from research that we are all along a continuum of social and emotional competence, even as adults. Is anybody here kind of thinking, got it, I'm done, I'm so socially, emotionally developed, I'm done. I think we, yeah, yeah. Um, we all know that there's so many things in our lives that we're working on. We have strengths in some areas, maybe not so as we, you know, still going through, you still have friendship issues at any age. Um, there are so many things that we deal with. So we're all on a continuum. Um, and we can, can, can continue to develop in these areas because the window to in, improve and grow stays open. Okay, so how do we do the work that we do and what do we mean by educating the heart? We create evidence-informed resources and build capacity across systems and provide practical ways to cultivate social and emotional development in children and youth and in the adults who surround them. So we developed this framework um, a few years ago um, in partnership with HELP, who are based at UBC, um, and also with a team of child development experts and psychologists. Um, and it helps to define what we mean by educating the heart. The heart is a framework. It provides us with common language about ways to categorize and speak about SEL, or social emotional learning. Um, and we have found that teachers in particular have found this very useful. And we have posters where they put this on their wall. And if some teachers have said, you know what, I've realized that it has made me think about, am I focusing on all areas of the heart? Am I helping to grow each area of the heart? I think for some teachers they would say, oh, you know what, I was focusing a lot on gets along with others and being compassionate and kind, but maybe I wasn't focusing on alert and engaged in my classroom or secure and calm in my classroom. So it really um, helps teachers think about it graphically and it provides a common language that so we go into schools and that everybody and all the staff attend and everybody shares this simple language and um, to talk about developing the heart or social emotional skills. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what, what we do, um, we've got lots of different programs and initiatives um, at the center. Um, so we offer a range of workshops. Um, we have a, our signature workshop with basically goes through the framework that I just mentioned um, and for three hours. Um, we have another one um, called Caring For You. And this is something that we, um, in the last few years, has become really important. We really understand now how important um, it is for adults to take care of themselves first. Adults aren't able to role model compassion and kind or secure and calm if they aren't that themselves. So we understand that they need to take um, care for themselves, and that's the workshop that um, focuses on that. We have a workshop called Secure and Calm, which focuses on one area of the heart. We also have one that focuses on adolescents. We have ones that's um, focused um, towards 
um, being in schools, how you could create positive climates in a classroom and in a school, um, and HeartMind parenting workshops. So I just mentioned that HeartMind in Schools is one of our initiatives, um, and we aim to develop an effective and evidence-informed model for integrating HeartMind wellbeing in schools. We have a conference every year and a half, so we've got one coming up in October if anybody's interested. Um, it is called The Art and Science of Calm. So it'll be in October. Um, and we will have um, Mark Brackett from, the, um, from Yale and Car Carl Honoré and Susan Kaising Greenland and many others who will talk about how we can develop calm um, in our schools and in our communities. Um, and there's another range of initiatives, I'm not going to go through them all, but the last one, HeartMind Online, is something that is worth noting because that is where we share all our free resources that you can go to, um, where we have, if you're a teacher, we have lesson plans, um, if you're a parent, we have ideas around um, how you can um, work with your children on issues of anxiety, you can do mindfulness, so we've got lots of ideas there and it's very easy to search on themes. You can search by child development stages, age groups, um, and I'll, I'll look, give you a look at that in a little while. Okay, so there's four influences on well-being that we talk about. Um, and we know um, from research that we can influence well-being in four primary ways. We can create um, nurturing environments, um, so this is both the physical and the emotional environment. So we know that kids can't focus on learning when they're worried about something, when they're worried about being bullied or picked on. And so we can do things in the environment, we can create safe and caring environments for children. Um, we can also create safe and caring relationships. And we know that all relationships impact on the heart, mind, well-being of children. So relationships between children and adults, adults and adults, and children and children. Um, we can teach specific skills, and I think this is kind of the, the typical thing that we talk about when we talk about social emotional um, learning, that you can um, work on skill development. Um, and you can teach specific skills, like problem solving, friendship, um, how to make friends, how to maintain friendships, that kind of thing. Um, and then the self-care of adults, which I already mentioned. Um, so the emotional state and the social ability of the adults caring for children affects the heart, mind, well-being of children. Um, so in the past, that wasn't a big focus. Um, it was almost as if adults were just there to deliver the content. You know, that wasn't important, but we, well, we understand that so much now, especially with the burnout rates for teachers and that it's so important that teachers and adults who care for children um, take care of themselves. So when we talk about heart, mind, well-being, we, talk, we, we get people to think about how they can work on those four areas of influence to help the development um, of heart, mind, well-being. So another important piece is being intentional. Um, so in order to promote heart, mind, well-being, it's important that we are intentional. In order to grow plants, for example, um, certain things need to be in place and attended to um, in an ongoing way. So the same is true for supporting children's heart, mind, well-being. Um, so we advise that when people are working with kids, that they think about and ask themselves, what am I weaving in today to help children develop those skills? So it's about being intentional. Okay, so I'm just going to go through you. At the beginning, I showed you the heart with the five pieces. I'm just going to quickly go through the pieces of the heart um, and what they mean and um, give you some ideas about how you can promote them. So the first one is secure and calm. I know people kind of laugh when I say calm. That's how the Irish say it. It's ca calm, but to me, calm sounds very posh, so I say calm. Um, so it's the ability to take part in daily activities and approach new situations without being overwhelmed with worries, sadness, or anxiety. Um, so when children are not secure and calm, they have difficulty connecting with others and are too fearful or nervous to learn because they are always on guard. 
So having this quality doesn't mean that life is easy. When children have this quality, they can bounce back from difficulties. They are resilient. Um, and we know that this is a big issue. We know that one in five children in Canada um, suffer from anxiety. So this is something that we um, really need to um, focus on. And this is why we speak about this quality first. It's the foundational quality. As I said before, if children aren't calm, they're not open to learning. They're not curious. They're not willing to play with others. There's so many things that they're, when they're overwhelmed, they're not able to connect with others. So we start with this piece. So how do you help children to be secure and calm? So these are a lot of the ideas that we have on our website, on HeartMind Online, that you can go and check out. Um, and you've already heard some of these ideas come up, I'm sure, in the last few days as well. Um, so you build safe and caring relationships with them. Um, in safe relationships, children learn social emotional skills. They learn to regulate their emotions. They learn to express their needs and solve problems in securely attached relationships. Um, build interactions that, interactions that include open expression of emotions. Um, so this is a big piece. Um, and I don't know um, if you have talked about this over the last few days, um, maybe not, but around um, emotional awareness and how important it is to help children to develop um, emotional literacy. And what we mean by that is they're able to identify how they are feeling and others are feeling and they're able to put labels on those feelings. So we know from research that um, when a child correctly identifies and, and labels their feeling, that soothing neurotransmitters are emitted in their brain and it helps them to calm down. So physically we know that um, through brain scans that this is what is happening. So that is really a really fascinating thing. But it's not just that they, so you might say to a, um, a kid, oh, you seem really mad. And they're like, no, I'm not mad. I'm frustrated or I'm upset or I'm disappointed. It's when they can really get to the thing and correctly identify, it's then that they're able to calm down. But you can help. You can say something like, you can, you know, say, I think it looks like you are this. And then they can say whether you're right or not. But it's, it's also helpful to kind of begin them on the journey of expressing how they're feeling. Um, and I think that's a really fascinating thing. I was really fascinated to learn that something can happen in the brain to help you calm down, if you can correctly. Yeah, do you have a question? I just wondered if there's been uh, further research on whether the actual like, articulation of the words is necessary, or if a child can tell a story that it passes that feeling to them, like the story I, of what led them to feel this way, if that's just as... I think that what we've seen is that, or what we see is that it can work differently for different kids. So whatever it is that, um, so for some kids, and um, using words is very helpful for other kids, and especially younger kids when they're pre-verbal, um, using colors. And you know, you've heard of the zones of regulation. And so using, and so about, and, and that's to do with energy as well. So how are you, are you in the blue zone? Are you in the green zone? Are you in the red zone? So a lot of kids, my daughter's in kindergarten, and that's what their teacher um, does with them. And um, so, yeah, I think if you can, can it's, it's about understanding, and I think that's what we're um, trying to get across, is it's the relationship between you and the child and understanding what works for a particular kid, because all children are different, so understanding what will be helpful for them. Joanne, yeah. can, can I add to this? Uh, there are two things I want to say. In Sukhomnitsky's experience, he used different flowers like flowers of different colors, he would have them available, and children would put a flower into the vase at the start of the class to show what kind of mood they were um, just at the beginning of the class. And an interesting story about this flower thing, so one, once with elementary school graders, he, uh, he came into the classroom at the beginning of the class and he saw a beautiful pink 
kids, so I don't remember exactly, but the, the color would show to the kids more or less, happy to see him. And then during the break, he left, uh, yeah, during the class, he had his watch, he took it off because there were no clocks on the walls, so he took off his watch, put it down on the desk, and he was checking the time. When the uh, bell rang for the break, he took his watch, put it back on his wrist, left the classroom. When he came back for the next class, he noticed the color of the flower was uh, like more like eggplant, which actually shows the mood would change to a very depressing one. And he tried to figure out what happened, and he couldn't because he felt like during the class he didn't do anything wrong. And he spoke with the kids then and he asked the kids and they said, you don't trust us. You took your watch from the desk and you left with the watch. So you thought we could steal the watch or what? So the kids at, in elementary grades could feel that Deep, and with this flower, they showed their disgust, if you will. Yeah? And there's one more thing. I want us to be absolutely clear. I put this name here, and as a person who was trained in history of education, I want you to remember the name. Johann Heinrich Pistolot says, Swiss educator. He is the one in the 18th century, at the beginning of the century, He's the one who actually put together a concept of hand, heart, and head being developed together. And everybody else after developing this concept in many different ways based on the concept which exists in psychology today. But the first, and very coherently, head, heart, and hand come from him. So please remember this name. He was an incredible educator. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting for me too. I'm going to look that up when I get back to the office. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and actually, when you're speaking about teachers and that, that how they are in the classroom, one of the things we also know is that when we're talking about secure and calm, is that stress is contagious. And that's a piece of research that was done here at UBC in Overlay and shown at Reichel. Um, did a study with um, elementary school kids, 400 of them, and they um, took um, samples of their saliva and measured the cortisol levels. And they also um, measured the burnout levels of the teachers. And they were able to predict um, the, the children who had higher, level, higher levels of cortisol had teachers who had um, burnout. Um, so we're not sure exactly the relationship. It's bi-directional, most likely, um, but it's worrying. Um, but we do know it's stress is, like, um, is contagious like a yawn. Physically, you will pick up the stress of somebody else that you are um, in the room with. Um, and we all, we all know that. We all know that we quite often don't like to be around people who are stressed because you start to getting a little bit agitated yourself. Yeah, yes? A term in psychology, toxic culture of the classroom mm -hmm. or of education. Mm -hmm. So the toxic culture is definitely contagious. And when you are within this culture, you feel it and it depresses you and it impacts in a negative way anything you are doing. Mm -hmm. Be, uh, your students or teachers, regardless. Mm -hmm. it, it does impact. And so there's just some more other ways that we've listed there, listening and talking with children to help them to be secure and calm and to encourage safe risk taking. Um, sorry, what time am I meant to be finished at? Okay. Okay. Just so that I know that I'm so I'll, okay. Um, so compassion and kind is the next um, area of the heart, um, and c 
compassion and kind is the ability to be aware of others' emotions and desire to help when a person is in need. So that's actually the definition of compassion. When you notice somebody else's suffering and you desire to take action. Um, kindness is a little bit different. You don't need to see that somebody's um, suffering to be kind. You can just do something nice, give them some flowers, say a kind word, hold the door open. So that's a little bit different to, to compassion. Um, so, quick question, um, who here thinks that we're born to be kind? Okay, so let's just watch a quick little video. So, the researchers um, Warnikin and Tomasello found with this, these are 18 month old and they've done it um, subsequently with younger kids, is that children will help without um, expecting any reward. So it looks like they are intrinsically motivated to help. Um, so we are born with the basic building blocks of kindness and compassion, um, but yeah. Yes. Some children more than others? Um, well, we think every child, yeah. That's what the research is showing, that every child. But what happens? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I heard um, recently at a conference here at UBC, a neuroscientist, um, neuroscientist speaking, Richard, Dr. Richard Davidson, um, and he said that we are born with an innate goodness um, and that it's best to regard kindness in the same way as we view language. It does not develop in a vacuum. It requires nurturing from adults in the child's world. And he argues that without that nurturing, kindness will fail to further develop. Um, and that's something that we are, I think it's only in the last few years that we are talking about it in this way. It was just always viewed that we were born kind of like, um, th that it was always adults that were there to impart the, the goodness and whatever, and children are only going to learn that way, but it actually is there as a building block. We just need to be able to nurture and guide um, children. Okay, so these are steps that you can um, take to help children to be compassionate and kind. You can model kindness and gratitude. Now, gratitude is something that has been very um, popular in the last few years. Um, and the reason being is that um, it has huge benefits to practice gratitude. And um, research shows that gratitude can improve general well-being, increase resilience, strengthen social relationships, reduce stress, depression. The more grateful people are, the greater their overall well-being and life satisf satisfaction. And it goes on and on and on. There's so many benefits to practicing gratitude. And what is, it, what is gratitude? It involves noticing the goodness in the world, but it doesn't mean being blind to the tough stuff. Um, it makes sure that in the midst of things um, that are serving up like a dose of negative feelings, we don't lose sight of the good. So it's all about not losing sight of the good. And it's a really good practice for children to notice the small things and to be thankful for it and to, if they can, thank the person um, for, for that thing. Um, we can help children to practice kind acts. So give kids an opportunity to be kind. So we know volunteering is very um, beneficial um, and help children to develop a caring identity. And what we know, um, it's interesting because I was listening to um, you talk about the bets and the rewards. What we know about empathy is that giving um, rewards um, does not work according to the research, that giving um, candies or anything to try and help children to be more pro-social and helpful doesn't appear to work. So we want to um, try and help children to be intrinsically motivated rather than extrinsically motivated. So um, by helping them to understand that they um, have a caring identity seems to help. So saying things like, I noticed you help your friend, 
you're very helpful. Not being, not over justifying it, not being, oh, you're amazing, you're so awesome, clapping and making a big hoopla. It's about noticing and saying, I noticed that you were helpful, or I noticed that you were kind, I noticed that you shared. And um, so it's noticing it and saying you are helpful or you are kind or whatever, and then kind of just leaving it at that. That seems to be the most helpful way of promoting um, pro social behavior. Joanna, yes. Uh, another educator I mentioned, Makarenka, from the beginning of the 20th century, he was using a tool which he called a behavioral act which is done in secrecy. So how it translated into practice, he would say a child, a teenager, who is on the train or street train or tram, and uh, he's allowing a senior person to sit down and there are other teenagers around. This doesn't count because everybody sees he's doing it. But if he's doing it when he's by himself and no one can praise him, that's the best reward for the educator. That means this person knows how to behave. So go from what you said to the actual result. And the result is not when we see this kid, but when we don't see this kid, if he or she is doing still this. That is, that is when the result we achieved, when we really have the result. Because when we see it, it could be very much like children are playing our game. You know what I mean? Like they do what we expect them to. Um, and then just finally, use a positive and restorative approach to discipline and model empathy. So I'll just kind of quickly move on because I know we don't have a huge amount of time. So this next... No, you're okay. I'm okay? Okay, okay. Um, so this next piece of the heart is gets along with others. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't uh, mention that each part of the heart um, is represented by a color. So the color coding we find is, is quite helpful. So this one is purple for gets along with others. And it's the ability to form positive and healthy relationships with peers and adults. So children who are strong in this quality play cooperatively. They are respectful. They can express their feelings and they re accept responsibility for their actions. Um, so how do we help children to get along with others? Um, we um, help them foster positive communication skills, both verbal and body language. This is something that is like an issue now in schools with so many children um, being online all the time. They're losing the ability to um, develop these, ver these what seem very obvious skills, um, verbal and body language. Um, so it's helping them to engage face to face with each other and to learn those skills. Um, encourage physical games that help children practice that m the many social skills required in relationships. We know play is so important in learning a lot of these social skills and social abilities and getting them to play games and um, they will learn the skills that are required in relationships. Um, use mo books and movies to learn about relationships and this is something that you spoke about earlier with the postcards and le there's so much that we can learn from literature and we can learn so much from characters in books and movies about how they're feeling and about empathy um, and from learning different um, perspectives so that's so important about how we can build tolerance um, and help children to get along with each other so solves problems peacefully is another quality. And it's the ability to behave in a peaceful and respectful way in a variety of situations and relationships. So these children are able to navigate through challenging situations and resolve conflict peacefully. And they solve problems while respecting others and themselves. They're able to put themselves in someone else's shoes. So you can see that empathy comes up quite a bit. It's empathy is important for compassion. Empathy is also important for um, being able to solve problems peacefully and get along with others. Um, okay. And there's opportunity in conflict. So conflict is a normal part of children's lives. 
Um, so common ways that children respond to conflict include arguing and physical aggression as well as more pass passive responses such as backing off or avoidance. Um, so when conflict is poorly managed, it can have a negative impact on children's relationships, on their self-esteem and on their learning. However, teaching children the skills for resolving conflict can help significantly. So by learning um, to manage conflict effectively, children's skills for getting along with others can be improved. Um, so. I don't know, so some of the teachers here might, you know that when children are in conflict, it's quite often better to maybe let things go for a while and see how they manage the conflict themselves before you. So it's giving the space and time to see whether it is something. So depending on the age, obviously you may need to step in because the children may not be, somebody may not be safe or may be hurt. But if there's a chance that they can resolve, and if not, then you can kind of scaffold. You can come in and make suggestions or ask them how could they do it differently or how is the other person feeling in this situation. So there's a lot that you can do and help. And um, so that's how um, opportunity can be. Um, there can be opportunity in conflict. So we can help children um, to solve problems peacefully by um, teaching them basic problem solving steps as we talked about before naming the emotions that come up and um, see and take other perspectives and wait and avoid rescuing children from conflict okay so this is the last quality alert and engaged and this is a really interesting um, one um, so it's the ability to stay calm focused and alert to demonstrate self-control and to slow down and think before acting so there's a lot going on in there. Um, so being alert to engage means that you are goal directed. It is the opposite to autopilot. So you all know when you've driven somewhere and you can't remember 10 minutes later how you got there. It's the opposite to that. It's about, and um, when I started at the beginning of it with the mindfulness moment, it's about being very present and attending to what is happening to, to the here and now. Um, so children who are alert and engaged stick with activities for more than a few moments. They listen attentively. They work independently. They think before they act. They wait their turns for games, and they respect others. Um, the thing with being with this um, quality is that there are, are factors that influence it, um, such as the developmental stage, the age, and the temperament. So you've got those other three pieces that are important. And um, we know that children's ability to be alert and engage increases. There's a kind of, um, if you're looking at a diagram, it kind of goes right up at about age seven when you're executive functioning. So the functioning of, of um, the front part of your brain develops. That's when children's ability to be alert and engage really increases at the age of seven. So we talk to parents and teachers about expectations. It's about understanding the child developmental stages and understanding what is the child capable of at a particular age. Is it, is it um, can a three or four or five year old sit quietly for hours and listen? You know, so we understand that better now. We understand that some children need to be doing something, they need to be fidgeting, they need to be moving their legs, they need to be getting up for brain breaks, they need to be, you know, in order to be alert and engaged, they need to be maybe doing something with their bodies. So we have a great understanding of, of that now. So how do we help children to be alert and engaged? <laughs> The first picture is actually of one of our facilitators' daughter. This is how she likes to sleep half in, how to, hanging out of the bed. <laughs> sleep is so important. It seems like a very obvious thing, but we need to take care of our bodies first. Sleep, nutrition, drinking water, those are the things that really help children to be alert and engaged. Um, we know sleep dep deprivation um, has an impact on the cells in your brain, and they don't fire very well, and then we can't take in information. Of, um, we're not able to learn and take in information and interact with other people when we're tired. Um, we need to exercise, um, and I'll talk about a little bit about that in a second. Imagine replay. So, um, taking perspective of others enhances our cognitive flexibility um, it, if we're playing with others it requires inhibitory control. Um, other things like acrobatics, gymnastics, martial arts. So if you're doing martial arts it refi refines focus and encourages inhibitory control. Playing any sport or doing sustained activity releases, releases endorphins which sharpens focus and makes us feel good. 
singing and playing music. So not just listening to it, but it requires full attention, memory, and sequencing. Um, and then finally juggling. So we know that actually doing something new to you, and this is the same for adults as it is for children. If you learn something new and, and challenging, it has a huge impact on our brain and helps us to be alert and engaged. Um, So I just wanted to give you one example. So we do our workshops in schools, and one of the workshops that we did, um, a kindergarten teacher attended, and afterwards we heard that she had um, created her own lesson around how to teach heart mind well-being, and she recorded a little video, um, and she's based out in um, Richmond, um, and it shows. Um, how she weaved in heart mind well-being intentionally into her classroom um, and her key objective for the lesson was for her kindergarten students to understand how their emotions and actions um, affect others so she used different colored cut out hearts to represent aspects of the heart uh, hearts in the framework <laughs> So I don't know if you noticed at the end, um, or near the end, there was the kids were engaged in activities, and they, there was a heart place next to the activity that they were engaged in. And that's what the teacher did. So when they were doing something in the classroom, she would just walk over and not even say anything. And just so if she saw somebody sharing, she may put down um, the purple heart, or if she saw somebody being um, kind, put the orange heart next to them and walk away. So it's just even visually representing to the kids, this is the part of the heart that you are using and growing. Um, so we just thought it was a really nice just little example of what teachers are doing in their classrooms um, with this um, stuff. Yes? We need to stop yeah. there. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Um, sorry, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I have a leaflet of, of what we do and the website. So I really encourage you to go to the website because we've got so many resources. This video and lots of what I've talked about exists already on the, on the website. So yeah, it's a great free resource that you can check out. And Jamal, yeah. so because I, I wrote to you yeah, that we placed all the PowerPoints. Yeah. If you sorry. can leave a PowerPoint with me, I will place it on Canvas. So, for example, yeah. Sure. Alicia, yeah. Alicia, you have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, I know that you said you have parenting resource and mm -hmm. early child care. Yeah. Do you have suggestions on books to read? Or yeah, we've got reading 
lists on there. We've got yeah, there's lots there. Okay. So if if you're, we've got one of the ways that the website was set up. It was kind of um, very obviously um, set up for educators or parents, but it, it's for more care providers than that. But and so you can just do a search for resources that are related to teachers or related to parents. But there's various different ways that you can do um, that kind of search online. And there's lots, there's lots of lesson plans. And yeah, lots of ideas. We're constantly updating it as well. Yeah. Were you guys part of consulting on the new curriculum in these two years? We weren't part of that, but we part of Heartland Schools now is we have, and um, we're doing a lot of work and um, showing how our framework aligns with um, the BC curriculum. And we are developing resources for teachers to help them understand how it links. So when they're doing um, any of this work, and how they are also promoting the competencies. So that's a big part of our work right now. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. Can, can you um, just talk a little, sorry, talk a little bit more about safe thinking and how you and how you make that concept clear to children or how you encourage it? And um, yeah, there's um, actually, you know what, I, I'm trying to think of her name. There's actually um, a professor here. I think her name is Persimi in at UBC does a lot of work in this area around safe risk taking. Um, but it's understanding that children, a big part of it is understanding that children need to be outdoors mm -hmm. in nature. Mm -hmm. And they need to climb the tree mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, and they don't need parents hovering around them. They need to understand um, because it's really important for the future. If a kid is getting a driving license at 16, they need to have been able to take, to take risks at five and six and seven on a skateboard and the, all those because otherwise they, they, they don't understand um, how to act at that age. So that's the kind of stuff that we, we talk about. But um, but this is also from Gorcha. <laughs> so, and, and before him, many educators centuries ago were talking about same things. Mm -hmm. Mr. Watts is one of them. So it's, it's not new, as we can imagine. The world did not start yesterday, of course. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think we got yeah. too safety conscious probably in the last 50 years, you know, about what we allow kids to do. And, and I think we're trying to return to a, a time where children are able to be free and play freely. On helicopter. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And also I've heard about the, the, lawn, the lawnmower parent who basically you know, um, goes the long more and just spreads it, you know, gets rid of any obstacles. And children don't have to face any childhood obstacles. They clear the way, they clear the path for the Yeah, that's a new metaphor. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anybody else that had a question?